Hello everybody and welcome to episode 3 of On the Blood Trail. Well, bear season is finally here. It's actually been here for about two weeks now and uh, still too cold. You know, lots of snow, especially in some of the, the west and northern regions of the province. Um, hopefully going to have some more positive temperatures and get the chance to hopefully get out and do some scouting and find some bears or even some sign from some bears that are finally getting up doing a bit of a stretch and a walk around um, in the meanwhile uh, just getting gear ready making sure that uh, rifles are sighted in getting bored with not a whole lot to do here in all this uh, social distancing and quarantine life with some warm weather in the forecast here uh, double digits in celsius and I'm not really sure what that is in Fahrenheit offhand but it uh, gives a guy some hope that he's going to be able to get outside and do some archery shooting in the elements. And I know for me it's a goal every year to try and get out there and get a bear with the bow. Um, spot and stock that can prove to be a bit of a challenge. Um, but I mean we do it lots with a gun and lots of times we get inside a bow range. So chances are uh, if we're there and we're ready, we could make it happen. You never really know. Something that I, I said that was a little bit wrong on the last podcast about uh, uh, the forest fire with the moose and how everybody got drawn in there the next year and uh, slaughtered the moose because there was nowhere for them to hide. Um, it was brought to my attention that there actually was no draw at the time. And there, it was such a good moose area and everybody went hunting there because they, they were just in such abundance. And after that forest fire, they came in there, they killed a whole bunch of them. And then even for the years to come, it was the same thing over and over and over again. And um, from what I understand, uh, actually 10, it was like 10 years later when they actually implemented a draw system. Uh, so I wanted to clarify that because uh, it was brought to my attention that I uh, said something a little bit wrong there. And I'm always uh, willing to clarify any mistakes that I make on here. So... So for today's episode, uh, a question and a uh, topic that I want to talk about is uh, whether or not uh, you or someone that you've known has ever been faced with uh, the infamous buck fever. I know for myself, when I first started hunting at uh, 12 years old, I was set up in this blind, uh, I was hunting deer, I could see straight in front of me. Uh, down both sides of me, uh, sitting in the blind, perfect setup. And uh, first night that I was sitting there, dozed off, woke up, and uh, out my right side window was a uh, doe and two fawns standing on the road. And the emotions and the adrenaline running through my head as a kid, I get the gun ready get it all lined up on this doe and uh, take it off safety pull the trigger and uh, the deer stand there for a couple seconds and then they take off checked for blood absolutely nothing so knew that I missed not entirely sure why I missed um, so still sitting there I'd seen a couple of deer flash sightings across in front of me um, a couple more, uh, the same place that I had missed that doe on my right side, and hadn't been seeing anything out the left side window. And not even sure why, but I took the Velcro window that is inside the blind, folded it up over the left side. Thought, nah, I'm not seeing anything out there. I'm, it's whatever, it's kind of pointless. It's distracting me from looking out the two windows that I actually am seeing deer, <laughs> being 12 years old. That was the thought process, I guess. And uh, so I remember the one afternoon I'm sitting there. I hadn't seen anything for hours. And uh, I peeked at the Velcro window, which was uh, kind of printed over with some sort of camouflage and made it darken so that you couldn't really see through it. And I noticed there was a strange spot. And I thought, man, that's, that's kind of weird. So that must be a deer outside, like coming down towards me. And uh, so I, I get up, I poke my head all the way through the front window of the blind, look down to the left, and there's a buck coming down the road. So 
So get back into the blind, slowly and quietly trying to take this uh, this Velcro window back down. Like I wouldn't even say inch by inch. It was pretty slow and painful trying not to make any noise with this thing. Um, lucky for me, this buck was rut crazy and in love. And uh, get the window, I think it was about half open, good enough that I could get my gun through there and, and get the buck in my sights. And uh, real good 4x4 four four buck. Not sure what he would have scored. I know when I was 12 he looked real big. And uh, walk in front on. And I know a lot of people, and we'll get into it in another podcast about shot placement. But shooting... A deer front on isn't a bad shot. You're going to take out his boiler room and he's not going to go far and lots of times they'll drop right there. Uh, especially depending on your caliber. But for some reason I had in my head that I, I couldn't shoot the deer yet. And he come closer and closer and I watched this deer come from... Had to have been 200 yards plus And he's walking and walking and, and he's closer and closer. Doesn't even realize that the blind is there. And he comes right into, I, I'd say probably 30 or 40 yards. Like, close enough, he could have shot him with a bow. Easily. And I didn't pull the trigger. I was so mesmerized by this buck that was coming so close to me in my blind. And everything else I had seen had been like 100 yards, 200 yards. And this deer was walking right at me. And it somehow it caught me off guard. And I was frozen in my tracks. And this buck came all the way up to like 30, 40 yards. Turned to the left. Walked into the bush. And I never saw him again. It was a good story. Because I uh, didn't have any proof that I had seen this deer. Outside of the tracks that were there. And it actually took me a few years. To realize that I... At that time, I was caught up in buck fever. I was so rattled that I couldn't couldn't even shoot this deer. I'd taken the gun on and off safety like three or four times because I was like, oh, I'm going to shoot him. No, no, I'm not. I'm not ready. And uh, ultimately didn't and wish, still wish to this day I would have shot the deer. Um, it's, it's easy once you've had those situations happen to yourself or if you're sitting alongside someone else and you'll remember that situation for a long, long time. So I've been been posed with those kind of situations a few times. And that was the earliest one, being so fresh into hunting. And I just didn't know how to handle myself in the situation. I, I don't know if I wasn't familiar with uh, what I had going on or, or what the deer was doing, the behavior. It just caught me off guard. On this topic, it's prompted me a little bit to uh, do some looking into what the uh, so-called internet experts think about buck fever. Um, And uh, so some of the symptoms that everybody kind of already knows uh, get heart pounding, uh, your chest is pounding, uh, shortness of breath. Uh, (laughs) I even read somewhere that in some extreme cases it's caused people to fall out of their tree stands. And uh, which leads to more severe stuff, but it can be a pretty real thing for some people. And uh, for some people, it's it's to the point where they can't move. They're sitting there, they're shaking. I've seen it on hunting videos as a kid where people are like, "Oh my goodness, I can't move. I can't do anything." I, I and they're like, "Oh no, they got buck fever. They're they're frozen. This is this is a lost cause. We're not going to get anywhere with this." And uh, So looking into how you handle that situation is a big thing because I find if a person gets stuck into that situation, it's very hard to get out of it and it becomes a recurring problem. And so if it's not taken care of abruptly, then it could have long-term effects on, uh, on your hunting. Let's look into some of the Uh, preventative measures uh, for if you're faced in a situation where you think you have buck fever. Um, Some ways to uh, reduce that situational stress, uh, try and get your head a little bit more level, uh, and how to handle that situation. Uh, So first and foremost, being prepared is a huge thing. Uh, Know your area, even if you're just sitting in a tree stand, 
uh, or in a ground blind. Know your possibilities of where you're going to see these animals. Um, if you got trail cameras set up, then you're going to know that you have a chance at certain animals in the area. Always a chance that you're going to have that ghost that never comes in on your camera that's going to come in that day. Uh, you got to be prepared for that. And know where your animals are crossing. If you've hunted that area lots or you've scouted it out thoroughly, there's really no reason why you shouldn't know where the main travel patterns are. Because uh, chances are, if you're setting up your blind or your tree stand in a certain spot, it's because you know you have a vantage point on those travel corridors. And by knowing these travel patterns and the different game trails, uh, it kind of gives you a feeling of being in control. Because I know for myself, if I'm sitting in my tree stand, and I know that uh, I'm deer hunting, and I know I got deer coming in from a certain direction, I know that there's maybe two spots, maybe three, uh, that they're going to come across, and if I'm ready for them, then I'll get my shot off. So it's really key to know your spot and uh, put in that practice and mentally prepare yourself for the... Uh, the chance that one is going to come across that trail. Secondly, you got to know your gear. You got to stay practiced. You got to stay familiar with your gear. If you're changing something out on your bow or your rifle, something that's going to make a big impact on your shooting and your consistency, it's very, very key to make sure that you've practiced to the point where that feels second nature. And you're not going to have a situation where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm pulled back, um, I don't know, you got a, a different anchor point because you're using a different release, let's say, because uh, everybody bounces between uh, using a thumb release or just the trigger releases. And so making sure that you're prepared, uh, practiced up with your gear to make sure that you know what's going on and it's not going to catch you off guard. Uh, like a good, uh, good instance would be uh, talking to one of the guys at the archery shop here in, in town. And he said that somebody he knew had switched to a back tension release and came to a full draw on an animal. And with the adrenaline, he couldn't gauge how much pressure he was putting on his string. And leading the animal actually set off the trigger and launched an arrow into the tree next to the animal. So handling yourself in those situations and knowing your equipment is so important uh, so the biggest one that i think uh, for handling buck fever or potential buck fever is uh, gaining experience every chance you get get into the bush try and put yourself into a situation that is real it's very very easy for us as hunters or uh, I don't know let's say uh, as target practicers because that's what we are for majority of the preseason to have that ideal situation you walk outside you set up your target at 20 yards you stand there everything's perfect wind is good let your shot go hits the target move it out to 30 yards 40 yards 50 however far you shoot and just keep shooting it's it's a perfect controlled environment and when you're out in the bush, you don't get that. You don't get the chance of, oh, this deer is going to walk in perfectly broadside. Yeah, the chance is there. You can put yourself into that position if you set your stands accordingly or um, or if the animal just reads the script because sometimes that happens. But majority of the time, you're going to have something go across you and it's not going to be exactly as you had planned it out or the exact same way that you had practiced on your targets at home. And it's good to be prepared for a situation like that, just in case. Another thing you can do, uh, if you're somebody that's only going out and say you're only hunting for, uh, let's say deer. It's the most common thing to hunt for here in Alberta. Uh, in most of the U.S. as well, uh, elk hunting is on the rise big time. Uh, but a lot of guys will go out, they'll shoot their deer, and that's it for the year. If you're somebody that's struggling at shooting the deer... Try to explore other options. Try to get out with some guys or friends or whatever that say that they're going out and they're going to do some, some coyote hunting. Uh, just any extra exposure you can get to being in a, a quote-unquote hunting situation. Uh, because I can tell you right now, if I'm out hunting for deer and 
a big buck or a good buck comes across, gets your nerves going. If you're out hunting for, I don't know, elk, you get a bull calling back to you and he's coming in, man, that gets your nerves going. It's no different with anything that you hunt, big game, small game, if it's an, a high energy situation, chances are your nerves are going to be going a little bit, you're going to be a tiny bit rattled, and it's very similar, and how you handle it is going to be very similar to any other situation throughout your hunting experiences. Now, all these things can put you into uh, the mindset, the proper mindset of how to handle when an animal comes across, how to avoid that buck fever instance. But at the end of the day, you really just have to learn how to deal with it. And that's the hardest part is you're sitting there, you haven't seen anything in a while, you hear a branch break, and you know that your target animal is coming at you. And if you've been sitting there and you haven't seen anything, it, it catches you totally off guard most times. So you need to be able to get your, your gun, get your bow, get it ready, get, get ready in your, your mental state to take this shot. Got to control your breathing, that's probably the number one thing. Take your time. Remember all the training. Remember your steps. Remember your, your mental game of preparing yourself for that situation. Everything that you have done has come down to that one split second decision of whether or not you're going home successful. And if you can deal with that, then you're not going to have any problems. But putting in all that work to get to that point is super crucial to making sure that you can handle that situation. Now, another way that you could do this if it's something that you struggle with on a consistent basis is uh, write yourself notes, uh, leave it in your truck, um, tape it to your gun, tape it to the inside of your bow limb. Uh, just go through it, go through the steps. Be like, okay, gotta control my breathing. Got to know my area, got to make sure I'm paying attention to these trails, make sure, uh, I keep going back to bow hunting, but if you're sitting in your stand and you know that your trail is in front of you, make sure you know what the, what the range is. Make sure you know how far the range is to just a little bit off either way of that trail. If you can make sure that you put all these steps in uh, as soon as you get into your stand, if you haven't seen anything in a while, keep revisiting those things, and when that situation comes you're going to be more equipped to handle it. You can also be in the situation where you put in all this practice. You've been faced with buck fever. Um, your target animal comes in. You do everything you can. You control your breathing. Something doesn't go right and you still miss that animal. It's human to make human error. And it's important not to beat yourself up about that. It's, uh, I can't stress that enough. And because it is human to dream up that perfect scenario. You've watched it enough on TV. Everybody talks about it. The deer came in like on a string and it just came in perfectly broadside. It was right inside my comfortable range. I took the shot, made a perfect impact and the deer hardly went anywhere. It's that perfect scenario that everybody dreams up. And it, it, sometimes it happens. It happens quite often. But there's more often than not that you're not going to have that situation. And you're going to have to be able to make that split-second decision that ultimately decides what you're going home with. And that's, I'd even call that a, uh, a quote-unquote too-perfect scenario. And sometimes a person gets too caught up in this perfect scenario. And I know for myself... Uh, another flashback into uh, one of my own hunting mishaps. And I haven't really, outside of uh, my usual hunting circle, talked about this really with anybody. I was in a position where I hadn't shot anything with my bow in uh, five years. I went out every year, and the goal was to get an elk with the bow. And every year it was the same thing. You get chances, something wasn't perfect or it wasn't a uh, legal size. Uh, 
something happened. It just didn't work. He couldn't couldn't close the deal. And uh, so five year drought. Thinking this is my year. Been practicing super hard, putting in my reps, making sure I've been just laying the arrows into this target. Uh, all the way out to 100 yards we were shooting and making good shots at 100 yards. Um, not that I would try that in a, a field situation, but the further out you practice, the more comfortable you're going to be at the inside in between yardages. We got into this field and we heard elk bugling. We knew that we were running out of time because they were a lot further across the field than we were. And we weren't going to have much time to cut them off. So we go running back across this field. We get around the corner. We can start to see some of these elk clearing off the field into the bush. And we weren't going to have a chance. So we hunker down and a couple of cows went off. Uh, and in, back into the field. And so we did a little bit of cow calling. Sure enough, uh, there was a satellite bull that was a 6x6, six six, not a huge one, but still a 6x6. Six six. Comes into the field, lets out a couple of bugles. We're thinking, man, okay, we're going to have them. We're going to have this bull. There's no way we're going to mess this up. Let out a couple more calls. Bull turns and he's coming right for us. We didn't have a whole lot of places to hide, so we just got down nice and low, and uh, I got my bow up in front of me, getting ready. This bull comes up to, I think it was 57 or 58 yards, and I get my bow pulled back. All of a sudden, he knows that we're there, and I take my shot. And I think I shot right in front of him. Bull takes off running into the bush. And sitting there hunting with my brother. We both have tags. He gave me the opportunity to be first shooter. And it feels bad when you're given the, a situation where you can actually close the deal and you mess it up. Now, I'm not entirely sure still to this day why I missed that elk. But I quickly discovered in the following days that it was a big time human error. Because a few nights later, we get set up. We had put up this new tree stand in a totally different spot. And there was elk in that area. It was just a matter of whether or not they came out by that tree stand. We're sitting there and... Uh, it was, it was kind of a hot and a cold rut. So you're hearing elk in certain areas and they're bugling. And then in other areas, they're being totally quiet. And it could have been pressure related, but we didn't seem to notice a whole bunch of hunting pressure at that time. So we're sitting in the stand and we hear this bull bugle. We think, all right, we're just going to stay quiet. It sounds like it's coming this direction. And an immature bull steps out in front of us uh, i don't remember exactly how far it was it wasn't very close um probably about 100 yards so we're sitting there we're watching this bull thinking okay maybe the rest of the herd's coming he's just a satellite and all of a sudden we hear this bull bugle and it, it wasn't this bull that we were watching it was a different bull and it was in the field with us we just couldn't see it because of where we were in our tree and so this bull, he's got to be a couple hundred yards down the field, down the tree line from us. And sitting there and talking back and forth with my brother, I'm thinking, all right, well, what do we do? And I, I looked at him and said, well, how about, uh, how about I try a, a small bugle? What's it going to hurt? Chances are that uh, you're going to get his attention. Whether or not he likes it is another story, but they're rutting, so maybe he's going to get aggressive. So I let out this little bugle. Uh, for somebody that doesn't bugle a whole lot, I thought it sounded pretty good. I was impressed with myself. And almost instantly, you get a bugle back. And you can tell from this bugle back that this bull is running towards us. 
And for a bull, especially having this immature bull in front of us that didn't want anything to do with it, this other bull was totally game. So that told us that it's probably a shooter. We're going to get ready for this. So we're both getting ready with our bows. And this bull breaks out in front of us. And he's got eight points on one side, seven points on the other side. I've never seen anything like this ever, right? So add that on top of the missed a bull a couple mornings before and, and been skunked for five years already. So nerves were up there, right? And uh, so I come to full draw. Uh, Ryan tells me, yeah, you shoot him. Take him. Bull comes in, reads the script. Like, I, I'm telling you, he came 40 yards, broadside, no idea that we're there. And I'm at full draw, 40 yards. I pick my spot, slowly squeeze the trigger, and I have zero clue where my arrow went. I don't know if it went over the elk. I don't know if it went under the elk. I don't know if it just vaporized on the way to the elk. But I didn't hit him. He took off running, and I had missed up not just my second chance in his, uh, a few days, but like the chance of a lifetime on a, on a bull that's got eight points on one side, seven on the other. That's almost unheard of in most areas. And so a bucket list item there that I just blew completely. I was so frustrated, so upset. I was about ready to wrap my bow around the tree that we were in. I'm surprised my brother didn't push me out of the tree because he wasn't very happy. And by rights, there's no, no excuse to be missing at that range. And especially on an animal of that size. And so what happens for a lot of people, and I have talked to others that have had similar situations, Things like this, it might not seem like much, especially if you're by yourself. You can kind of play it off when you're by yourself. But when you're hunting next to somebody and they gave up their first shooter position for you to do it and you mess up, oh man, does that do something to your confidence? And it pushed me to the point where I wanted to quit bow hunting. I was so frustrated, I never had any issues with gun. And for some reason with a bow, I just, I couldn't seal the deal. Five years. We hunt a lot of different animals here in Alberta. For some reason, I couldn't close the deal on anything. Missing, like, gift horse, 40 yards, broadside. Perfect. I can't, I can't even hit that. So, extremely frustrating. And with all that compounded stress, it just made me want to give up bow hunting entirely. And... I needed to find a way to cope with that. So after having my own <laughs> pity party, so to speak, I spent a lot of time talking with my brother. We're super close, have been forever. Uh, spent a lot of time hunting together. We've seen all of each other's ups and downs. Uh, some talking with even my dad, big time hunter, has been for a long time. He's seen and had his fair share of hiccups for sure, and decided that just going to continue practicing. Something's off. I don't know if it's me. I'm going to go. I'm going to change some stuff on my bow, and maybe that'll make me feel better about myself. Maybe that's going to make me feel like, okay, I changed this. This could be something that's throwing me off. Now I'm going to be ready. Something that could mentally put me into the zone where I knew I was going to be able to seal the deal the next time I got a chance. I had to overcome this new developed target panic that I have gotten because I've now missed two bull elk. I had never shot an elk with my bow. And so I needed to get over that. I just continued the grind. Getting into the tree stand every chance that was possible. Going out and chasing elk every chance that was possible. Even after that situation where I had now missed two bull elk, I still went out. We went out, uh, my brother and I, Ryan, and the idea was that Ryan was going to be the shooter. I was going to try and sink back, be the caller. If something came back around to try and circle us and I got a chance, then maybe if it was meant to be, I would get a shot at one of those elk. But I wasn't wasn't hopeful. I was still pretty dejected, but I wanted to get out there, keep putting in the reps, and try to get 
myself into that mindset where I was ready. Because obviously I wasn't. So, after exhausting my attempt at getting an elk that year, it was time to go home. Uh, we got a hunting spot for whitetails. It's a lot closer to home. And we had this spot figured out where, for some reason, the whitetail bucks at that exact time of the year, it's usually that week of the year, like to cycle through. And it's usually in bachelor groups of three or four. Uh, and then the odd stragglers. But there's always bucks cruising through there. It's not very many does. And if you get in there at the perfect time, you're not going to bugger up the scent. And if you get there at the perfect time, you're not going to ruin the scent in the area. You're not going to throw anything off of its normal um, habits. And so I got in the stand and we knew we had some good bucks in the area. Lots of uh, uh, smaller bucks, ones I would say hadn't quite reached maturity. And sitting in the stand and the one night had uh, this one buck come in at about 45 yards and not in a very good spot to take a shot and he just bedded down he had only like one antler I don't even know what was going on on the other side it was something that looked like maybe a point coming down the side of his face we never even got pictures of him and he came in with another buck and they had both just fed right off the trail and bedded down so couldn't take a shot at them uh, had a really small buck come out right in front of me wasn't going to take the shot because I wanted to wait for something bigger and uh, so the next night sitting there hadn't seen much of anything the very end of the night I start lowering my bow down the tree and my bow was almost at the ground I think it was about six or eight feet off and I looked up and here was a big buck that was just starting to come in. He was like 25 yards. Rounded the corner, seen my bow hanging out of the tree, turned around and, and made like dodge and got out of there. And so just compounding the frustration of just not being able to put myself in the proper situation to make something good happen. So the next day, I get in there and uh, it's getting towards the end of the night. This buck comes out on uh, the trail where the other deer had bedded. Uh, it's kind of a hard angle because there's some limbs in the way. And he turns and starts coming out right towards me. And I thought, okay, I'm going to shoot this deer. I get full drawn. And the buck stops just in line with his limb. And... I tried to lean forward in my stand and kind of around the limb. My bow was nowhere near level. It was kind of almost sideways, probably looking at it. And I let the arrow fly and I missed the deer. It wasn't a perfect situation by any means. It was actually far from it. And by rights, I should not have been shooting. But after being so stressed and putting in all of this effort, you get that chance you want to do everything you can to make sure that you're capitalizing on something and I just didn't make it happen and so even though I knew in my mind that it wasn't going to happen on that shot I was taking a shot into the wind I it was it added on to the frustration that I had already had and then the next night I kind of fought myself mentally decided all right I can't give up on this. It's going to happen. I, I, I'm trying too hard. It's just something's got to give. And I go and I get into the same stand. I'm sitting in this stand and uh, I hear this deer going across in the bush. I thought, all right, I'm going to try grunt calling at it. I let out a couple of grunts. Deer turns, comes towards me, kind of stays inside the bush. But it was a doe with a fawn. And uh, got upset, started snorting and parading around the trees like something was 
wrong because it couldn't figure out why it came into a call and there was nothing there. What I didn't realize was that by grunting, I had actually uh, grabbed the attention of some of the other deer and they crossed a little bit closer towards me. And I noticed this buck come out and he was right at the very edge of where I could, uh, where I could even see. And I let out a couple grunts and nothing happened. He just kept standing there. Uh, he was taking a look off into the field. And all of a sudden, this deer turns and starts walking right towards me. I thought to myself, well, maybe this is the chance. I've got my bow in my hand, uh, arrow knocked on the string. I've got my release clipped to my D loop. It was game time. And this buck started coming in because of me calling. But then it had noticed where I had walked into my stand and started smelling my trail. And so it got a little bit further than the deer I had just missed the night before and stopped, quartering towards me a little bit. And I'm at full draw. And I can honestly tell you that when I let the arrow fly, it was a complete blur. I remember putting my pin behind the shoulder where I thought was going to be a good angle to take the shot. And after that, I can't remember anything but seeing the deer take off through the trees. I knew I hit it. I was terrified to death that I had just gut shot this deer. Went back and talked to uh, the other guys that I was hunting with. Explained the situation, said, yep, yeah, shot this deer. I think I shot him a little far back. Hard to tell. And uh, so we went in, did a little bit of looking for blood. We found a tiny bit of blood, and it was dark. And from our experience, dark blood is uh, not a great shot. And so we found where the blood had started to go. Decided, all right, we're going to give this deer some time. Uh, we went back sat down, had some dinner, and uh, sitting there and doing a little bit of collective thinking about what happened to the situation, trying to clear my thoughts, I had decided in my head, I'm like, yeah, I, I know for a fact that I got this deer in the lungs. And so after talking about it, we decided, all right, let's go and see if we can't find this deer. We went to where we had just found a tiny bit of blood, we walked up that trail another five yards and there was blood everywhere and bubbles in it. And I was like, yes, right on. And we start getting up the trail and sure enough, there's this buck laying there. And I can't explain the excitement going through my mind. After all this time of hunting, after all these missed chances, five years of not getting anything with a bow, not to mention that it was actually nine years since I had shot my last whitetail buck with a bow. So the anticipation and the hype was definitely there for me. And I just, I couldn't even control my emotions. I started shouting and screaming. I was, I was so excited and it wasn't even a big buck. It was, uh, it was one of the bucks that hadn't even reached maturity and uh, for what we had wanted in that area. But Getting the monkey off of my back and actually closing the deal on a deer like that and finally having a situation work. It wasn't a perfect situation. It was one of those situations where you had that split second decision. I had that split second decision to make. And when I made it, it resulted in me being successful. And I think the fact that it was a situation like that helped my confidence so much and and I can honestly say that getting that deer with my bow renewed my love for bow hunting because it's such a fantastic sport to get into, especially with how close and like you just, you got to be inside of all the close quarters of these animals and you can't, there's so little room for error and every error that you do make is so, uh, it seems like it's so amplified because you know that there's something you could have done differently or there's just something that the animal did that wasn't according to the script. And you just, 
it, it was so rewarding to be able to close the deal on getting a, a nice to me what was a nice buck one of my well he's my biggest buck with a bow at the time it's just super exciting and i was glad that i had put in the time and the effort to do it now to get to some of the people that may be stuck in the, the situation that i was in where even if you're not in a drought of getting something with your bow maybe you just recently started having these problems how do you avoid buck fever in these future situations you stay practiced you change up the routine a little bit to try and keep yourself uh, feeling fresh don't go out there and shoot at the same target at 20 or 30 or 40 yards like you do every day change something up um, uh, sometimes we put a, a tree stand up in the tree we'll climb up the tree and, and take shots at our target and that kind of gets you prepared for a so-called game day situation and you got to remind yourself that whatever moment that you get to take a shot at an animal that might be the only chance you get so if you're not prepared when this animal comes out to take that shot and it leaves you may not get a chance like that for the rest of the season and i know that i've been caught in situations like that too uh, where you pass up deer because you're like, oh no, I know I'm going to get a better one here. It's too early in season. And then you don't. So you got to make sure that you're, you're in the mindset that whatever chance you get, you got to know in the back of your head that that might be the only one you get and that you got to make the most of that situation. You got to remember everything that you put in, all the practice. Remember to control your breathing and just be ready for that situation. You got to make the most of it. You can't overthink it. And it's so easy to overthink when you got an animal coming in and you're like, oh, I got time. Sometimes that's the worst thing. I know for me, a lot of times uh, you have an animal come in and you know it's a good one and you only have that split second. You make the, the choice, you make the shot, and you're rewarded. I find most of my mistakes are when I've had too much time to look at the animal. Because then you overanalyze it and then something goes wrong. And now that I think about it, another good point that uh, I think people seem to overlook is stopping their animal at the proper time. Uh, a lot of times people actually, uh, they'll have this uh, animal coming in and they'll be like, yeah, all right, I'm going to take my shot. And they don't stop the animal or they wait too long or stop that animal too early and that'll actually ruin your situation as well because then all of a sudden you don't have the shot angle that you need or or any shot angle maybe and that results in your animal taking off into the woods and never to be seen again as well so uh, another big thing is making sure that you have that uh, foresight and knowledge to kind of know where you're going to have your shooting lanes and not stop the deer at the start of the trail or stop it after he leaves the trail or take a shot at it while it's on the move because sometimes you might be lined up on this on this animal and it's on a slow walk and you're like okay i'm not going to have very much uh a distance from where i'm aiming to where it hits but then all of a sudden it picks up as you squeeze the trigger and it takes that split second and all of a sudden your shot goes from a good shot to either marginal or terrible and uh it's a very important thing to make sure that uh uh, you know when to stop that animal. And I'm going to stress again that even when uh, it does come time to pull the trigger, man, you're breathing. If you're, if you're not controlling your breathing, your nerves aren't going to calm down at all. And it's going to make you forget your anchor point. It's going to make you grab your anchor point in the wrong spot, whether or not that's with your, your hand on your bow, uh, whether it's gripping your bow or you're, you're knocking. Like, it just... It could be where you're resting your gun into your shoulder. It could be how close you're looking at your scope. And that's lots of people get scoped in the heat of the moment. They're a little bit too close. They're anticipating the, the excitement. And the biggest key is to try and hold on to all of that excitement until after you pull the trigger. Not as you're pulling the trigger, not before you pull the trigger, after. If you can... Keep all those nerves inside until after you pull the trigger. Chances are you're going to make a good shot and you're going to have a whole lot to celebrate. Or you're going to have a whole lot to be bummed out about if you didn't do it. Because 
you let the nerves get the best of you and something happens and you mess up. And especially for somebody that's new into hunting, um, whether it be somebody that's older or somebody that's uh, a youth just getting into it, so important to follow all these steps to make sure you're going out and getting all the proper exposures and the experience and, and putting in your, your, your time and making sure that you're practiced and you know your areas and, and your gear. It's just, it's so important. You can't stress it enough. It's so important to teach people this because I know people that have put themselves into a rut where it's, it's like it's target panic, but on the animals. And every time they shoot at something in their head, they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to hit it. And I know of people that every time they do it, they make bad shots. I know of people that every time they do, they just miss it entirely. And it, it comes down to being uh, unpracticed. And if you practice up to be prepared for those situations, you don't have anything to worry about outside of controlling your breathing. If all you got to worry about is controlling your breathing in a situation uh, where it's time to seal the deal you're probably going to be okay. Because if you don't take care of this target panic and you don't take care of this buck fever that you've been either developing or developed, then you're going to be stuck in that rut for a long time because if you're stuck in that to begin with, you probably don't have the proper support from your buddies, your friends, your family, whoever you're hunting with. Either they're giving it to you or they're not helping you with it or... You just don't have those people around you and, and you just keep finding yourself stuck in that rut. And the longer that you wait, the harder it becomes to fix. In telling you these stories uh, of how I've been affected by buck fever or just psyching yourself out or uh, target panic, whatever you want to call it, I hope that you guys enjoyed it, uh, learned something from it. Uh, I know that I learned something from myself from going through those situations uh, sometimes it's nicer to learn things through other people before you have to learn the mistakes uh, through your own actions. And uh, especially in hunting, because that can be the difference of having that 8x7 bull hanging on your wall or watching him go running into the trees because uh, uh, you done messed up. My goal is by talking about it that it may teach somebody that didn't know how to handle it or didn't realize that maybe something that they were doing may be a symptom of this target panic or buck fever, whatever you want to call it again. And I hope that it helps somebody that's out there in a situation like that. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, if you haven't seen it already, on our YouTube page on the Blood Trail, I edited up a hunt that we had done for bears last season. And uh, I took my own personal best bear. Uh, we figured that he was somewhere in that 450 to 500 pound range. Uh, you can be the judge of that, I guess. I'm a pretty big guy. And uh, sitting behind it, the bear still looked pretty stinking big to me. And uh, two of us couldn't even lift him into the truck. And uh, we even tried to winch him in there with ratchet straps. It just didn't work. And uh, the following day, we had gone back in there to... Uh, just kind of check on the carcass, see if anything had touched it, and uh, nothing had really. There were some tracks going around it. Ended up coming up the road a little bit further, noticed a couple of bears together, uh, spent a little bit of time skinning out the head from my bear, and uh, when we ended up coming back around, uh, these two bears were down feeding on the bear carcass, and we were able to take the boar and... Uh, that was uh, our buddy Spencer, and that was also his personal best for a bear as well. And and for bears, only one thing's going to eat another bear carcass, and that's usually a, a big bear. And uh, so, if you're interested, go check that hunt out. Uh, it's on the YouTube channel. Uh, I think I've got a link for it on the Instagram and the Facebook page. Uh, I'll even throw one out on Twitter. Uh, if you haven't already, you can go ahead and. Uh, Follow on the blood trail at on the blood trail on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can search it on any of those and you'll find it there. Um, the podcast is now available on 
and I think there's 10 different streaming services. I put it up on YouTube. Uh, it's on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and a whole bunch of them. So if uh, somebody you know that might be interested in listening to it hasn't uh, been able to because they don't think that they can listen to it on a certain service, then I promise you there's one out there that they have access to. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up this episode and uh, hope you guys enjoyed what you heard. Um Hope that uh, the weather breaks here and that everybody gets a chance to get out and chase some bears and and try to get back to feeling normal again. And Best of luck to all of you, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.